Hello and welcome everyone um, to session one of Hearts in the Ice and Resilience through Extreme Citizen Science, Building Skills with Explorers, Educators, and Scientists to Empower Change in an Uncertain World. My name is Laura Brandt. I'm the Project Manager for Aurorasaurus, and I'll be facilitating the Q&A today. Today, we're excited to highlight partnerships between Hearts in the Ice and some of our project leaders. We'll start by watching a video today, introducing Hearts in the Ice, and then I'll briefly introduce the projects. We'll hear a short science presentation from each of them. After that, we'll have an informal Q&A with the project leaders. As you watch the presentations, please put any questions you have in the chat. I will pull them out and give you the opportunity to ask them live. Also, please be conscious that we plan to save and share the chat to our workshop page. Feel free to live tweet if you feel so inclined. I will paste the Twitter handles in the chat right now so that you can do that. Um, and we'll go on and start our first video. Can everyone hear the sound okay? Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Med hjerte i isen er en ni måneders historisk overvintring på fangsyt av Bamsebu på Svabar. Overvintringen gir oss en unik mulighet til å oppleve de magiske skiftningene i det arktiske lyset, kjenne på polarnatens makt og naturens krefter. Og målet er å leve i harmoni med naturen og dyrelivet. In our modern world, we've gotten away from a need to actually live off the land and survive. And so, what an incredible experience to just take away all that distraction and look at this around us, 360 of beauty and silence. Vi har begge sett store forandringer i de polare områdene og ønsker å gjøre noe og bidra. Vi vil bruke våre ni måneder på Bamsebu til å formidle et enkelt og energibesparende liv. Vi ønsker å skape et engasjement og invitere til små endringer i folks liv der hjemme. Vi håper at vi ved å dele våre opplevelser, våre observasjoner, testing av nytt utstyr og forskning på Bamsebu kan inspirere andre til å bidra med ryddeplass, være bevisst på emballasje, matavfall og energiforbruket deres. Kun noen få kvinner har overvintret på Svabar, men aldri uten menn. Jeg kan huske den første drømmen som jeg hadde. Jeg var 10 år gammel, og jeg ville gå til the moon. Fast forward til den alderen av 30, I was invited to be part of the first team of women to ski to the South Pole. 67 days, 700 miles, 200 pound sled. It was the most grueling expedition of my life. But there's nothing harder than the load that I feel by having borne witness to all of the change in the Arctic and the Antarctic over my close to 25 years of exploring in the polar regions. Helt siden jeg var liten, har jeg trivdes med snø og vinter. Som tolvåring fikk jeg en bok om fangsthistorie på Svabar av faren min. Samme året fikk jeg en polarhund som het Nannok. Han var en fantastisk turvenn og en flott trekkhund. Ved siden av hundekjøring har jeg fått mye felterfaring her i Arktis, inkludert et opphold på Bjørnøya i Anmain. Alt fra fangst, storviltjakt, lange ekspedisjoner, og mer enn 200 isbjørnmøter. Jeg har kjent på det barske været og lange måneder med polarnatt. Jeg føler at mine 23 år på Svalbard gjør meg godt rustet for overvintringen. Both of us will become citizen scientists. We're going to collaborate with researchers, and we will share out the impacts of microplastics in the ocean, of which we know there is plenty, changes in the permafrost, which is a very real thing, changes in the atmosphere and changes in the ice and the wildlife. For 10 år siden var det et studie med døde havhest. De åpnet mavesekkene og fant plast i 5 av 45 havhest. Nå 10 år senere gjentok de studiet, og denne gangen hadde 40 av 45 havhest plast i magen. And I'm, I'm actually a little bit afraid of the polar bears. I have read a lot about polar bears. I've seen a lot of um, 
beautiful video imagery and stills, but I've never been in a place where I, I'm actually can't get away from them. I know that um, it'll subside, I'm sure. Det er jo kjærligheten til disse fantastiske områdene som gjør at vi har så sterkt behov for å bidra. Kan våre ni måneder på Bamsebu engasjere oss alle til å foreta små justeringer for å bidra til å snu endringene vi ser? Med små grep kan vi sammen få til store forandringer. Dette året kommer til å endre våre liv. That was phenomenal. This was a video that Hearts in the Ice made before they went to Bomb Cebu the first time. They are now coming back and concluding not one, but two overwinters at Bomb Cebu, during which they gathered data for nine projects and conducted calls with over 100,000 young people around the world. Uh, one of the things that has always struck uh, strike me uh, about citizen science in general, but is undeniably exemplified by Hearts in the Ice, is how many interdisciplinary skills citizen scientists bring to their passions um, and how important these skills are to the science they help advance. So I'd like to introduce our speakers today, uh, some of the scientists and project leaders who worked with Hilda and Sunova over the last two years. Uh, you can find bios of each of these folks with links to their projects on our CSA Connect workshop page, and I will post the link in the chat shortly. I'd like to welcome Dr. Liz McDonald of Aurorasaurus, Marile Colon Robles of NASA Globe Clouds, Allison Cusick of Fjord Fido, Dr. Eric Sachik, coordinator of the remotely piloted aircraft systems hub at the British Columbia Institute of Technology, Yanna Sorada of Access, de-icing of Arctic coasts, critical or new opportunities for marine biodiversity and ecosystem services. And finally, Dr. Jan Arsch of the Norwegian Polar Institute Polar Bear Monitoring Program was not able to be with us today. So I will give a short overview of his work with Hearts in the Ice. Before we begin uh, watching the videos, does anybody have any comments to make? Laura, I just wanted to jump in as uh, kind of the convener, um, this workshop was my idea. Um, and I'm so glad people are here today and so glad that we can kind of come together around um, both the science in this session today and then what's beyond Hearts in the Ice and like looking at the project as a whole in our second session. Um, we have another fabulous panel there as well, but uh, they've really inspired um, all of us uh, in the science and the citizen science. And this was my first experience with what I would call extreme citizen science, where um, it's not just, in some ways, it's not just ordinary people collecting data where they are, but people who are, who are on an expedition. And so it's uh, quite different in that way. Um, but I'm just glad that we can all um, come together and shed some light on what they are doing and share that. And we hope to, impart um impart that to you all and welcome your participation and questions and um uh, you know um where you're coming from uh however we can make this uh useful for everyone we're really happy to do that so uh welcome and also um allison cusick uh not just a project leader from um university of california uh, sorry scripps um but uh also our co-convener here as well. Um, Allison, do you wanna say anything more just to kick us off? Yeah, thanks Liz and thanks for everybody for being here and Laura moderating today's session. It's awesome to see some of you again on, on Zoom who I've actually met in person. And um, for uh, those who have joined live, I just think that 
um, especially with Hearts in the Ice, you know, these are two women who are pushing their own boundaries as polar explorers and, and natives to the Arctic region, but also um, trying to do as much as they can. And so I think that um, hopefully through watching all these videos with at least the research side of things that um, that demonstrates that the power of these two women bringing everybody together is really the power of all of us trying to address this um, climate crisis and climate issues. So I also hope that the point isn't lost on anybody that the reason they were able to or sec did a second winter over was because of the pandemic that has somehow in weird ways united us all uh, for this cause. So uh, hopefully those elements are also woven through the thread of today's session and um, I hope you enjoy research updates from everybody. So thanks for being here. Great. Thank you so much, Liz and Allison. So we'll go on and start our videos. We're going to watch these straight through. So if you have any questions uh, while you're watching them or thoughts, please put those in the chat. Um, I will go on and get that started. My name is Liz McDonald, and I am very excited to talk to you about results from the Hearts in the Ice Aurorasaurus collaboration. I am the leader of the Aurora Source Project, and we um, work with volunteers around the world to take observations of the Northern Lights. We've been doing this for almost 10 years and together have uh, researched new types of Aurora, including one that citizen scientists called Steve. This was our project's first foray into what I would call extreme citizen science. Uh, and also has led to connections to um, tourists who are very interested in the aurora and maybe in polar regions um, on vacations and can also still be contributing to citizen science there. So this is a very different world for us, um, requiring a different operations and flexibility um, and setting of expectations. And so that's something that we worked with Hearts of the Ice um, and the other teams on, and I think it was very rewarding. So um, they took uh, what I would call regular observations of Aurora from their daily lives from Bom Sabu, the hut that you see here. I started to realize that there was another Aurora opportunity um, because I talked to other researchers in Svalbard um, at Longyearbyen at the university there. And they have cameras uh, that study a special type of aurora from Svalbard up there. And they also support um, other special campaigns involving actual rockets that are flown from Norway and instrumented to study the Northern Lights. And that's a collaboration with NASA and the Norwegian Space Agency. Uh, and there was actually a big campaign of rockets going on. So I will get to that more. But it was very exciting to be working um, with them and and make that make something happen there. And they really exceeded my expectations as far as their dedication, how much inspiration they provide to all of us. Um, and they really are ahead of their time. They're really pathfinders on this mission and there are so many cross-disciplinary connections that I never would have realized so it's very exciting um, but since Svalbard is so close to the pole that their winter season has no sunlight at all for such a long time you can actually see a very special type of aurora in December when it's dark at noon and so those observations are rare and very interesting in terms of our project we um, do citizen science kind of like eBird in space um, with observations of the Aurora. It is a global project and you can join in and learn more and receive alerts for Aurora and citizen scientists reporting Aurora around your location. Um, this is kind of the one slide overview of Aurorasaurus, what we typically do, which is through a website or an app interface. Um, and we do have a number of publications on the science results and the utility of this data, which are very well suited for scientific analysis, um, since we are so data starved in this field. So you can definitely check us out and myself or uh, my project manager, Laura Brandt, will be happy to talk more. In the past, uh, from Svalbard, 
which is way, way far north off the coast of Norway, um, people have explored uh, that land, which was not peopled, um, and for the mineral resources and what's going on in space as well. So um, one of those people was a scientist by the name of Carl Stormer, um, and he and others before him put on expeditions to go mapping around Norway. And even a hundred years ago, he was among the very first to photograph the aurora from multiple locations with his assistance and his like proto citizen science network um, of people with cameras. They actually took coordinated observations and were the first to establish the, the true height of different types of auroral forms and also extensively catalog them. So that was very exciting. Um, the picture on the left, uh, Hilda and Sunova basically recreated in their modern gear and their modern set, uh, cameras and looks quite similar as well. So what was this rocket opportunity? So what you see here is a view of uh, the landmass of Svalbard. And then this is the um, northern Norwegian coast, uh, including a place called the Andoya Space Center, where they normally la launch rockets. Rockets all have this kind of parabolic trajectory, um, and they are instrumented to go above the aurora. Um, they can actually actively cause aurora or tracing of the neutral winds in the high upper atmosphere. Um, and they're looking for different types of aurora, but there was a whole campaign in 2019 um, involving multiple rockets and the um, CUSP campaign. So there were three rockets that were scheduled to be launched from that winter season. And I talked to those scientists and I said, oh, you know, you have people um, with cameras at this more southern location than the two towns where you have the primary science grade cameras, um, Nyalesund, where the rockets from Svalbard launch, and Longyearbyen, um, where more of the people live. But Bomsabu is actually in a more advantageous location to look up at the apogee of these rockets. And so the scientists were interested, and Hilda and Sunova were like totally interested in doing more. So um, here I have two uh, movies of the type of artificial aurora uh, that was captured by Hilda and Sunova at Bomb Sabu. That's on the left. Um, on the right is another different rocket of a similar type measuring the cusp aurora and this artificial aurora um, that um, creates its own light to illuminate these neutral, invisible particles. But uh, you can see there's some similarities between the two. Um, and, you know, I'm really, really glad that after two weeks of, of trying to launch, the scientists I know were extremely tired in their campaign, whereas Hilda and Sunova were still extremely excited to be participating. Um, and they... Uh, they were ready to go. They got a text message by sat phone and went outside, dressed quickly, safely, took their gear, set up their cameras, and saw this beautiful and strange sight. So we have just started to get the data back last summer and process it. There's 40,000 images or so, so it's going to take a while to process all of those. Um, in total, they've observed Aurora on about 30 days and nights in Svalbard. Um, including eight days of labeled cusp aurora. And again, the cusp is a different type of aurora that's actually caused by the particles from the sun directly interacting with the Earth's atmosphere. Unlike the usual type, which takes a more circuitous path through the Earth's magnetic field, magnetosphere region. Um, so there's just observations um, like this photo, with this beautiful purple background and extremely faint but distinct aurora. And it really reminds me of this quote from John Steinbeck uh, that it is advisable to look from the tide pool 
to the stars and then back to the tide pool again. So they really exemplify these connections, um, curiosity and acceptance, um, and how life responds to the variations in the Earth's magnetic field. That's a really far out there science question that we may be able to um, explore best through citizen science. And it's also really difficult to get funded in any other ways. Um, there's also not really a direct connection between aurora and climate change, but it is something that's starting to be investigated. Um, in theory, there could be some effects. And again, it's one that's well suited for expert citizen scientist observers to potentially um, see something and then bring it back. So there are some lessons here for moving forward. Um, really, we wanted to be curious, um, be flexible, and respect all of the expertise that Hilda and Sunova have brought to this expedition. So with that, um, I think there's much more room to talk about where we can go from here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marile Colon Robles. I'm the project scientist for NASA Globe Clouds and NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the work that Hearts of the Ice is doing related to clouds. The GLOBE program stands for Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment. It's sponsored by NASA, supported by NOAA, NSF, and the Department of State, implemented by UCAR. It's been around for over 25 years. And it started when students and teachers working with researchers and scientists came together on ways that students can take observations of their environment that then can be used in research, scientific research. This is a picture taken from the annual GLOBE annual meeting a few years ago to show the breadth of participants. There's over 120 different countries participating in the GLOBE program. On the left hand side, you can see a plot of cloud observations taken um, in the last uh, 20 years. And you can see that there's been a great coverage and large number of observations in every single continent. And if you notice, that includes Antarctica. Now, in 2016, the GLOBE program released the GLOBE Observer app, which you can see a snapshot of it on the top left. What was done is select a number of protocols that do not need anything other than your mobile device to take those observations of the environment. Clouds is one of those where your instruments are your eyes. And we ask you questions to detect where you can report to us, sorry, the cloud types, the total cloud cover, opacity, and other sorts of information so that when we, the GLOBE Clouds team and NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, receive those observations, we then compare them to satellite data. We try and compare each possible observation to the series instrument on board Aqua and Terra satellites. We also compare observations to Calypso and to geostationary satellites like the GOES satellites. This is really important because satellites are great, but they're not perfect. Sometimes the satellites can detect certain types of clouds, while us on the ground can detect the, an, another type of cloud, mostly those that are closest to us. So it's really important to have multiple data sets and then be able to compare them to see what's going on and how do the ground observations compare to the satellite data. Why are clouds important? Clouds change even within an hour. When you go outside and make cloud observations, you'll notice that they might, be, might change once you're done using the Globe Observer app to report the clouds, the clouds that you saw. They're one of the most unknown things because of their rapid change, and also because they interact with both the sunlight and the heat escaping the earth. So they have a 
quite the impact on Earth's radiation budget. We can also learn from them how water vapor or water is moving around in, in the Earth as part of the water cycle. And also how clouds and cloud types in particular are reacting or responding to the changes in the climate. Some participants have reached out and told us how they're seeing certain types of clouds more often than before or not seeing or observing certain cloud types. And this becomes important because although there's many types of clouds, there's only two cloud types that produce precipitation. And precipitation meaning rain, snow, sleet, freezing rain. So there's implications if you start seeing more of these two cloud types that produce precipitation as the same if you reduce the amount of times that you see them. Now here's a picture of where Hearts in the Ice team is located in Svalbard. And on the left is a picture from, taken from the satellite through NASA. And you see a lot of white. Everything that's white is not necessarily a cloud from a satellite's perspective. But you notice that there's a lot of sea ice, snow, and clouds all mixed together. This is one of the reasons why ground observations of clouds is important because as you as the observer on the ground can tell us if there's snow or ice on the ground as well as clouds. Well, whereas with satellites, sometimes that's hard to observe. If you notice also, there's a lot of different types of clouds um, where some may seem to look hazy, others very puffy or round. Those are also very important. From satellites, we get temperature, and we get the amount of water or ice inside of the clouds, but we don't necessarily get cloud types. We can deduce the cloud type space and those information. But you as the ground observer, or hearts in the ice as a ground observer, can tell us the type of cloud, which is very important as well. If you notice one of their pictures on the right, there's a lot of things happening there. And this is really important to notice because satellites have noticed different instruments, sorry, on board satellites have noticed this very thick layer above the surface or above the ocean. And we're trying to figure out if it's actually clouds or is it haze, meaning aerosols that then gather water around them or coagulate, causing them um, this view. One of the satellites that we're most interested in is Calypso. Calypso is a laser that can look through different layers and can detect clouds and aerosols. And in the Arctic and Antarctic regions, it sometimes detects what it looks like a really thick cloud right above the ocean surface, like on the left hand side pointed by the arrow. This is one of the researcher research questions, sorry, that we're trying to get through the help of Hearts in the Ice. The more observations that we're able to match to Calypso, the better we'll be able to really understand what is actually happening. Here are some other observations from Hearts in the Ice. A picture is worth a thousand words. Again, through the pictures, either from Hearts in the Ice or you as an observer using the Globe Observer app, help us understand what is actually happening. If you notice here, there is snow on the ground, which will make it hard for the satellites to detect what's happening. There's also some clouds, thick clouds observed. But if you notice, that especially in the east and south view, those clouds are higher or not on the surface. So it's these are some of the cases we want to see in compared to the satellite data. If you notice in the north view, there is some blowing snow, which was reported by Hearts in the Ice. So this can also cause some retrieval um, aspects from the satellite that we need to take into account. While we gather all these information, we are excited to share the stories of Hearts in the Ice, either through the GLOBE program or through NASA, because uh, 
people like Hearts in the Ice team are extremely important for others to follow, either students, the teachers, or the general public. So as we gather more information, we are excited to see what we can learn more, particularly in these areas where it looks like there's a cloud right straight on the ground. Is that always occurring or is it only sometimes? And if it's sometimes, what is occurring in those instances? So thank you for your time. And we hope to learn more as we uh, follow hearts in the ice and their adventures in the Arctic. Bye. Hello, my name is Allison Cusick and I am the co-founder of the Fjord Fido Citizen Science Project. I am also a graduate student in the PhD program at Scripps Institution of Oceanography with Dr. Maria Vernet. Fjord Fido is a citizen science project that takes place in the polar regions on the Antarctic Peninsula with tour vessels and in Svalbard through Hearts in the Ice with Suniva and Hilda. For the past two winters now in the Arctic, Suniva and Hilda had a unique opportunity uh, to winter over in a hut, Bumzabu, and which is located on a fjord um, in Svalbard. I'm interested in understanding how phytoplankton, or single-celled uh, microscopic algae, respond to melting glaciers. So phyto just means using light for energy or a plant, and plankton means it's a drifter in the ocean, unable to swim against currents, and there's a huge diversity of phytoplankton. Each species of phytoplankton actually contributes, uh, plays a different role in the ecosystem, and so it's important to understand who is there and at what times of the season. So being able to look through the winter at the types of species of phytoplankton that exist is something that is really helpful for understanding how these winter communities might get set up to be ready for that spring when the sunlight returns and the sea ice begins to melt. In the past, researchers have thought that the polar night and winters are uh, times where there's not much activity, where uh, phytoplankton, which are algae that use sunlight to make energy, uh, might not be active. There, there wouldn't be much photosynthesis uh, going on. And recently, studies have been published that show that there actually is activity through the polar night. Another study recently found that uh, these microalgae or phytoplankton do not shut down their their machinery, which would capture light. Uh, instead, they stay ready to receive that light as soon as the polar night ends and the sunlight returns. Now, researchers haven't been able to access places like these to look through the winter, and so when the opportunity for Suniva and Hilda came along to be collecting samples on a near weekly basis from the fjord. Uh, this was something that was of great interest and that they could help to collect samples that uh, we're able to look at in the lab to see which species of phytoplankton are present. At the end of the first polar winter, Suniva and Hilda were able to uh, send some samples to me in California, and I was able to take those samples into the lab. And I have a little bit of video to show you guys what that process looks like. Here I am at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, as you can see. University of California, San Diego. It's a nice sunny day, a little windy, and we're going to go into the lab to see what happens to these guys. This is one winter worth every week through the darkness of the polar night, phytoplankton from Pumzaboo. 
Now these samples will get processed by myself and I'll extract the DNA or genetic information from the sample and then this will be able to get sequenced so that I can tell what species are present and I can see things like how the communities are changing through the polar night. This has been a huge effort by Suniva and Hilda. It's been awesome to get samples like this from this part of the world during a part of time where uh, research data is limited. We are so thrilled Suniva and Hilda are bringing awareness to the poles and have partnered as citizen scientists with Fjord Fido. The polar regions are dynamic and changing fast. These changes affect the biology of the ecosystem, starting with food source phytoplankton. I hope you're all enjoying the Citizen Science uh, virtual conference this year, and I hope you're all enjoying our special feature with Hearts in the Ice. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Eric Satrick. I am coming to you from Vancouver, British Columbia. And um, I am the coordinator of the British Columbia Institute of Technology uh, Remotely Piloted Aircraft Systems Hub. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but I'm here to talk to you about drones and their application in citizen science climate change research. So the main element here is the remotely piloted aircraft system, commonly known as, as the drone. And so the question here with respect to the Citizen Science Climate Change Research Project in uh, Svalbard, Norway, Hearts in the Ice, is what can drones do in terms of collecting data uh, on this topic? Uh, are they useful uh, tools in this type of research? And what are the, some of the things that we could collect information about related to climate change? So some of the possible applications that we explored uh, sort of initially were uh, the detection and tracking of polar bears. Uh, that's something that if you had a higher vantage point and uh, coupled with uh, not just a visible camera, but a thermal camera for those long uh, dark nights without the sun, uh, that comes in handy in terms of tracking uh, wildlife and and um, that type of application. Uh, phytoplankton mapping. So can this technology be used to detect concentrations and presence of phytoplankton in the marine environment? Uh, one of the main indicators of climate change and, and really a fundamental element of the whole food chain. And uh, the other thing we could po uh, we pondered uh, about the applications of drones is the their, their ability to 3D map uh, glaciers. So do a volumetric assessment of the amount of ice, uh, ice change over time. So getting down to the specifics of the equipment that we used in this uh, particular case, in this particular case study, uh, we chose the off-the-shelf DJI Mavic Enterprise Dual, uh, which was graciously provided by Indra Robotics uh, out here on the west coast of, of uh, Vancouver, of BC. Uh, this particular drone it has two sensors on it. One is a color camera, uh, an RGB uh, 12 megapixel uh, camera, and that's coupled with a forward-looking infrared sensor or a thermal camera that sits right beside it. And so the imagery that's captured is always both in RGB and, and in the thermal spectrum uh, for heat signatures. And so what the British Columbia Institute of Technology RPAS hub did was we uh, actually were able to provide hands-on training for both Sonova and Hilda on how to uh, use the aircraft to capture uh, data. So in order to accomplish the, the data collection, uh, we used um, a software called Drone Deploy, which allows you to create an automated mission plan, which can then be repeated uh, time and time again. The idea was to capture time series data over a particular area uh, to be able to capture some of the data that we were looking at, uh, hoping to get. And so basically once the automated mission plan was set up at a particular altitude with a particular set of overlap, the um, climate change research scientists, Sinova and Hilda, 
Uh, all they had to do is just go through a checkup, uh, make sure that the aircraft is okay, make sure the weather is within limits, that the aircraft is safe to fly. And then they were able to launch the drone. Once airborne, the drone captured the data automatically in a very specific way. Now they had a hand controller uh, with them, so that allowed them to take control of the aircraft and in any emergency situation, so as to avoid um, you know, collisions with any obstacles or in case the, the weather turned, they were able to bring the aircraft back home safely. So for the flight plan that was generated, uh, the result was 325 overlapping images. And by overlapping, we mean up to 80% overlap between each successive photo. And each photo was also tagged with a GPS cord. And so we knew where that photo was taken uh, in X, Y, and Z in real time space. Then the uh, images were loaded into a photogrammetric software um, where the images were uh, correlated together. They were essentially stitched together based on common points uh, between the overlapping images. And that allowed for a 3D reconstruction of the terrain um, that the drone was flying over. Um, and the great thing about this is that the the 3D model, the resulting 3D model, could be both in color, uh, like a color photo or color representation of the ground, but also in thermal. Uh, so we get a, a thermal 3D model uh, of what the drone flew over. So the results of the photogrammetric capture and 3D reconstruction uh, using the photogrammetric software we're basically two main products. One is what we call a digital surface model. So basically a representation of the terrain, um, the elevations that the drone flew over. And the other one is called an ortho mosaic or an ortho photo map. And that's basically where all the 325 photos are stitched together seamlessly into a nice mosaic representing uh, the ground below. And the resolution or the quality of this imagery is quite, um, Quite detailed. Uh, each uh, each pixel, each little element that the picture is made up of represents approximately three to four centimeters on the ground. So you get to see quite a bit of detail uh, in the images. And so that allows us to then go back and start doing analysis and measurements on what we see in these images. So with all of this data collected, uh, the question of course remains, you know, uh, are drones valuable tools to collect data about research uh, related to climate change. And so through the data that came back um, over uh, over the course of the last, um, I guess, year, year and a half, um, what we were able to do is uh, map glacial surface temperatures over time to track the change of how a glacier surface um, reacts to different climatic conditions. We could relate that to the uh, air temperature and uh, weather conditions at the time, how they're reflected in the image. Um, we could map the distribution of fresh water entering a marine environment. So because we set up the flight plan so as to capture both the uh, shore area and then the sort of intertidal area and then into the marine environment we're able to sort of track the changes of the distribution of uh, fresh water entering the marine environment um, and we're still looking to see if we're able to correlate what we're seeing in the imagery with phytoplankton uh, concentrations so what is it about drones that makes them a potentially useful tool in this type of research in this in this particular in this type of environment. Um, so one of the advantages of a drone is that they collect data over much larger area than you would normally be able to do on the ground uh, with with individual point sampling. Of course, the data that's collected is different. We were getting pixel values compared to um, you know, quantitative measurements. But the idea is, you know, can we correlate them? Can we correlate what we're measuring on the ground with what we see in the drone? and then interpolate that to, to the area that the drone actually covers. The data capture is fast and uh, relatively speaking, the processing is quick as well. Within the order of a few hours, uh, you know, the data can be turned around from pictures into 3D quantitative uh, mapping products. Um, so one of the examples that I explored with this technology down in Antarctica is to be able to map 
the volume or the size of uh, marine mammals, such as seals, for example, or polar bears. As long as they sit still long enough, uh, we could actually photogrammetrically measure their, their size and, and estimate a, a volume or a weight uh, without ever touching the animal. Uh, and we could do this for, for hundreds of individuals you know, over the course of a single flight. Um, the whole approach to using drones is interdisciplinary, collaborative, uh, adaptive, and cost-effective. Uh, so we've got quite a few research partners that we're um, relying on to, to provide data to and then, and then conduct the analysis. So it really bring, brings the, uh, the scientific community together in a, in a very effective way. So I hope that this has provided you with a bit of an overview of the application of our past technology to citizen science climate change research. Thank you for your time and your attention, and I look forward uh, to hearing from you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Duncan and I'm a PhD student with Eunice Svalbard and University Technology Sydney. Hi, my name is Vanessa Pituzzi and I'm a PhD student with the University Centre in Svalbard and the University in Trumsa. We've been really grateful we've been able to collaborate with the Hearts and the Ice ladies Hilda and Sinova. We went to visit them in March and got to see how their cabin works, how they've been living and meet their beautiful dog, which was a really great experience and quite inspiring as well. During that time, we had a look at the ice conditions with them and showed them our equipment and taught them how to take ice cores. So we taught them how to use the ice corer and take the associated measurements like snow depth and sea ice thickness. So they were then in a position to take regular cores for us. Since April, Hilda and Sinova have been taking cores for us once a week. This is very important information for us as it enables us to map the biodiversity of sea ice fauna more regularly than we would otherwise be able to do and capture the seasonality. In Saba, this topic is highly understudied. Thus, the collaboration we have with the Hearts and the Ice Ladies enables us to gather important information which is lacking, especially in the light of changing sea ice conditions. It's important information that we need in order to evaluate the effect of changing ice conditions on the Arctic coastal marine ecosystem more accurately. Let's dive in! I'm part of a team that is investigating uh, both the primary producers, uh, the ice algae, and the grazers, so the myofauna. Uh, it's very small organisms, generally smaller than a millimeter, uh, that live inside of the brine channels that form when, during the formation of sea ice. So you can imagine sea ice, the inside is basically like a labyrinth or like a Swiss cheese. It has lots of holes and channels that can be inhabited by small plants and animals. And my project is to look at the abundance, so the total number of these organisms that we find, how they fluctuate seasonally, is there a difference between the sites that we go within the fjord, so if we have areas of high snow cover, low snow cover, when it's shallow, when it's deep, and also when we compare season from at the start of the season, March, to the end, May. So right now it's end of April, so this is usually when things are starting to kick off. As you can see, the sun is shining despite it being past 6 o'clock in the evening. So this is in a way the interesting season when things start really happening and exploding inside the ice. I'm here in Van Meen Fjorden uh, to look at the ice algae. I'm interested in how Changes in light penetration due to difference in ice thickness and snow depth impact the nutritional content of the ice algae. I'm interested in ice algae because they are like the grass of the ocean. They are the bottom of the marine food web and so how their protein, lipid and carbohydrate content changes will carry through the ecosystem, impacting the higher levels such as fish, seals and polar bears. In fact, polar bears can derive up to 70% of their lipid content indirectly from sea ice algae sources. So whilst the algae might not be cute and cuddly, they really do matter. At each site, we collect multiple cores for both biological and physical parameters. For the biological, we 
we collect for ice algae and myofauna and the physical one is for salinity and temperature. After we take in the core, we go to our sample processing station where we put the core inside of a cutting board and collect the lower three centimeters for the biological cores and the whole ice core is cut into pieces for the salinity. Temperature is taken at five centimeter intervals which enables us to look at the physical living conditions and space inside of the ice. Hi, my name is Leni Runge. I'm a master student at Copenhagen University in climate change with a focus on the polar regions. So we're trying to take a consistent number of cores and for each core we're looking at three different things. So first of all, we're measuring the snow depth. Uh, and uh, after we um, made a hole, uh, we just uh, look at, uh, at all the sides to get like, a, like an average. So this one, for example, is 7, 6.5 and uh, 6.5 and then once we have made the hole with the drill we're looking at the thickness we're using this measure tape and then uh, we just stuck it in and measure the thickness of the eye so this one for example is exactly 50 centimeters um, and in order to measure the freeboard we have to remove the slash from the hole because that would give us a, a false measurement so once this is sometimes a very tedious exercise but once you measure it uh, once we've taken away all the slush that just naturally enters the hole when we drill it from the snow cover um we also do that here and that's about 1.5 centimeters at each sampling station we also take a suite of water related measurements we start by measuring the light penetration under the ice, as this is a very important factor for both ice algae and ice fauna. Then we take water samples using a Niskin bottle to investigate the nutrient content of the water and determine if the organisms are nutrient limited or not. Then we use a CTD to take a temperature, salinity, oxygen and depth profile of the water column. Occasionally, we will also collect zooplankton nets at some of the sampling sites to investigate secondary production in the water column during the spring. As some of the zooplankton that we find in the water utilizes the ice algae at the start of the season. As you can see, the sampling effort required to answer these important questions is extensive. It also involves us actually getting to the sampling sites, which generally means a two to three hour drive by a snowmobile. Not only is this time consuming, it is also expensive and dependent on weather and snow conditions. And it increases the carbon footprint of our research. Having the hearts and the ice ladies collecting cores for us from outside the cabin, we have been able to increase our capture of the seasonality of the ice ecosystem without increasing our logistical effort and environmental footprint. We've been really grateful to have this collaboration with the Hearts and the Ice Ladies, and it makes sense to collaborate. As Arctic explorers and adventurers, the Hearts and the Ice Ladies are passionate about understanding what's happening in the Arctic and how climate change is affecting it. And as scientists, that's also what we're passionate about, exploring and understanding. So together, we're using our independent skill sets to not only do the science and do the research, but then to spread these messages to the public. So it's been a really fruitful collaboration and we're looking forward to ho hopefully some more work together in the future. All right. Thank you all so much. And then I will share a little bit about the polar bear monitoring program involvement that Hilda and Suniva have been working on. Uh, this is again from Jan Arsch at the Norwegian Polar Institute. 
So one of the things that Hilda and Suniva have been tracking is a specific polar bear named N26131. Um, through a collar that she's wearing, uh, scientists know that she went into her den and probably had a litter both in 2020 and in 2021, but we're not able to get out to see her in 2020 in the spring. Uh, but Hearts in the Ice observed her with a cub. They would not have known that she'd even had a cub without that observation. Unfortunately, she lost the cub in the summer, uh, but Hearts in the Ice was able to observe later in the summer that she did not have a cub. Um, she went into the den again this winter and Hearts in the Ice saw her with two cubs, which was data they would not have otherwise had. One of the things that um, I love about this story is the way that Hearts in the Ice um, reflect on the experience of observing the polar bear. They said, we spotted N26131 in July directly in front of Bum Sabu, sadly without cub. We just heard the news that she has likely given birth to two new cubs near her den in Hornsund. She has a collar with a tracker, so they know from her movements that she is likely with cubs. This literally brought tears to our eyes. Another thing that they've been looking at is the uh, feeding ecology and diet of the polar bears by sampling scats, droppings, polar bear poop, uh, to get DNA signatures and also to observe what matters are found within that. Um, they were also able to observe predation on reindeer. Um, and in the same blog post, uh, Hearts in the Ice observed, the polar bears have found their way up to our hut, walking along the shoreline scattered with kelp. They must be so hungry at this time, since there is no ice, so no seals, so no food. We know that they eat kelp. Proof of this showed up yesterday with a clump of polar bear poop. So we collected a sample for Jan Arsch at Norsk Polar Institute. So thank you everyone for uh, your presentations. Um, did we have any comments from our co-conveners before we begin the Q&A from Liz or Allison? Just nope. that that was really fun to see the updates. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Looks like we have a lot of really nice uh, comments in the uh, chat and I am just catching up on those. Let's see. Um, Alice, you looks like you had a question for Liz about the Northern and Southern Lights. Would you like to ask that? Sorry, yeah, scrolling back to see. Um, I was just curious if that was only because of the fact humans aren't everywhere in the world where Aurora is, or if there's something more interesting about Northern Lights. Uh, I didn't see your whole question at all. Um, so the Northern and Southern Lights are basically symmetric, but the land mass distribution is definitely not symmetric. So that affects where we can see it. Um, and it's also particularly a reason why the cusp aurora can only be seen from basically Svalbard, as far as I'm aware, um, because it's the only landmass that's like that far up on the polar regions. Uh, it sounds like Petra had a question about the term extreme citizen science. Petra, would you like to unmute and share that? She had to go. Oh, she had to go. Yeah. Sure, she said... Talk to that for just a sec. So she was asking if um, extreme citizen science is in the sense that Mookie um, has used it, where it's more grassroots, um, and that's what's extreme about it. And uh, in this case, I think the term was really being used more for the extreme environment. And it's possible that uh, I actually want to kind of check, because um, I feel like I'm probably the one who wrote extreme citizen science, but uh, maybe everyone else is um, consistent with that term, or uh, I hope we didn't confuse anyone by that, but we didn't get any other pushback on that. I just couldn't, I know that I've seen extreme citizen science being used in other places, but um, I was looking for the origin of that and I couldn't quite fully remember. So I'm wondering if anyone else has like the polar, like Allison, are, is, is it commonly used in the polar regions? Um, or is that also a sort of new use for you? 
Um, this, I am sad to say, was the first time I had realized that our term extreme citizen science would have meant something different. So in our case, it was just ex polar regions are extreme uh, yeah, environments um, as far as, you know, weather and, and in the environment goes. But um, I do know there's a lot of discussion if you look online and at the citizen science community about terminology for different types of citizen science projects. So that is definitely something um, that's worth looking into. But the polar people would typically call this extreme citizen science. Is that what you're saying? I, um, just in the sense of environment, not necessarily yeah. in, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Allison, it sounded like you had a really great question from Marile about uh, cloud observations and smartphone cameras. Would you like to ask that? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was just filling up the chat with questions. Oh, no, great. <laughs> um, yeah, Marley had a great response. I was asking just if the cameras, because I know smartphone cameras are just improving every year, every other year, and if that was helping with these observations. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. So um, just having the ability for people to use their mobile phones to collect the observation has been groundbreaking, I think, because the benefits of citizen science is that people can move, right? That's the benefits of Hearts and the S is that they're in this extreme environment. And so we've been able to do that with the solar eclipse in 2017, and we're hoping to do something similar in 2024 during the solar eclipse. Why the solar eclipse in clouds? Because it's a natural, um, experiment where you turn off the sun if you're in the <laughs> in in that area where the sun is completely covered right and it's it goes dark so you really see the the effect of clouds in the changing temperatures um, as far as and because um, sorry and because people can take pictures of whatever right we noticed a few things in just that one data point that hearts in the ice collected but i have observations of the eeriness of mars looking in california from the recent fires um, there's photographs of dust events when it's cloudy so satellites could not detect those dust storms occurring but because we're in the ground we can say hey there's something occurring that you just cannot see um, as far as with the app you can do other types of observations not just clouds you can do land cover which again the the camera the type of camera now really goes into effect to look at those detailed observations as well as mosquitoes uh, you can take pictures of the mosquito larvae and so using um, you can clip on a microscope there's these teeny tiny microscopes you can clip onto your phone and identify if the mosquito could be one of those that uh, carry some of the diseases that could be bad for people. So yes, using being able to use the app and the, particularly the cameras uh, has been quite groundbreaking, I think, for the GLOBE program. I'm seeing in the chat a really interesting conversation about phytoplankton and specifically about training Hilda and Cineva to measure phytoplankton in various ways through ice cores, through drones, and through the samples that Allison um, has been gathering. I was wondering if uh, the three of you all might be interested in commenting on what you learned from training them to do such very specific work. I can just kickstart this. I know in the beginning of this whole conceptualization of what they would Hearts in the Ice would be doing, um, they brought together Yana and Eric and, and I and, and understanding how can this translate. And for the phytoplankton, I was just thinking of was open water phytoplankton, but of course how it's related to meltwater, um, that fresher water from melting uh, sea ice or from the glaciers in the area. So to see the updates from Yana and Eric is really exciting now to kind of really understand how these puzzle pieces can be put together. Um, because of course, you know, through the winter, that whole open water area froze over. <laughs> Yeah, I can just jump in a little bit here. Um, I'm, I'm really curious to see what we could see. I, I got a hard drive from Suniva and, and Hilda, and, and I'm just sort of organizing the data. It's lots of, lots of data points. Um, some, of it's, some of it's useful, some of it's not going to be useful just because of the 
conditions that they were taken under and, and things like that. But um, certainly very curious to see what we could discern from what's in the images. And do we have an, uh, um, the luxury of correlating what we see in the images with what they recorded on the ground, uh, you know, whether it's phytoplankton concentrations or uh, you know, surface temperatures and things like that. I'm really interested in the ground truthing aspect of it. And then the more we do that, the more we can then use this technology in, in, in other um, areas and, and, and for other purposes. So um, I wish I had some more concrete answers for, for you here, but it's it's all in the process of being um, analyzed. I actually had an interview with um, um, Chrissy Jones from CBC 60 Minutes yesterday, and and uh, she just grilled me on all these questions, and I'm like, they're really good questions. I'm like, holy cow, you guys did your, did your, did your homework. Um, but they really want to see results. I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I'm just inundated with all this stuff. It's just sitting there and, and you know, I'll, I'll get to it, obviously, hopefully in the summer, but really looking forward to what's, uh, what's, what's in those images. Yeah, that's funny that you mentioned the 60 Minutes folks. Um, I think that they, I, I don't know if I can or should say this, but I think they did get out to visit Hearts in the Ice recently. And I talked to those folks like months ago during the pandemic and they were asking me who's doing exciting Aurora research. And I was like, well, they are there, and but you can't visit them. So the fact that um, they're so prepared and they actually did, I think, get out to visit them at the very end of their trip um, is pretty exciting too. But That's, I'm wondering- um, I just Eric, wanted to give Yana a chance to to comment as well on that question. Oh, yeah, sure. I was going to go back to the phytoplankton. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Yana. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, of course, I'm living in Longyearbyen. So for me, I'm unmuted, yes. For me, it's been easier to collaborate with uh, Hilde and Suniva than for many of you, since I can have this more daily contact. Um, or weekly contact. So uh, especially now at this time of the year when it's easy, easier to travel, uh, we have actually get, uh, got ice cores from uh, people being visiting them so we can process them in the lab. But we did actually do a thoroughly a training of uh, Hilde and Suniva in uh, the laboratory at UNIS. And we see that it's very, very um, handy, you know, because something is to just read a protocol is not the same as actually see it in action. So I think that's a very valuable thing. And this is also to in a way ensure that there is no misunderstanding and that actually the data is uh, quality. Uh, and because, yeah, it's a lot of effort from their side and there will also be a lot of effort from our side where we actually get the samples. So I think it's very, very important to have these interactions. And then of course, it's also, makes more sense for Hilden Suniva or for citizen scientists in general to actually uh, meet the scientists and understand what the importance is. And we see that they get much more engaged and yeah, Hilden Suniva is anyway engaged, but uh, it's uh, give them a bit more ownership of what they're doing when they actually have this more hands-on training beforehand and also meet us beforehand. So uh, very valuable this, uh, collaboration and of course for us that would like to be everywhere at the same time because it's a short time period for the phytoplankton bloom and especially for the ice algae bloom so um, we need many hands and many people different places to get a good overview of the importance of ice algae in Svalbard actually. Thank you Jana that's a really important point about the collaboration. Liz what was the question you wanted to ask? Uh, well, I wanted to uh, resonate with what Eric was saying, that scientists are slow and citizen scientists, like Jana was just saying, are fast and can be everywhere. But, um, you know, getting to the science does take a while. So I was kind of wondering what the next steps were. Um, and I, I think this sounds like something that's, uh, it, to me, not knowing anything about this, it sounds unusual that you would put the drone observations and the ice core and the, you know, um, what Allison is doing in the lab, all of that together. So I, I was wondering if you guys have like target dates that were the most data was collected or how do you decide where to go from here? Great question. <laughs> um, I, I would just say from my perspective, since I have the selection of actual physical samples that were collected, 
um, that I would try to overlap those dates and times with the other observations or data collection they were able to make. Um, but also I think just fitting in the timeline, the different pieces of the you know, seasonality of what's happening. Um, even if I don't have a drone image on that same day, there might be something before or after or an ice core was taken at the thick of the ice um, part of the season or right as the bloom started. And so kind of seeing before and after that is sort of where how you can piece those together without having everything on the same day. But I don't know if Yana or Eric want to add. Well, I can just add that it was a very different year this year compared to last year. So uh, they only had an ice cover in March and it disappeared in April. It was just in the innermost bay. So in a way, it could be interesting to see if you have a different timing of the phytoplankton bloom and a different type of community dominating. So we were inspired when we heard that they were actually filtering samples for you. Uh, so, so then we were also asking if they could filter ice core samples for us. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think for it's going to be it's going to be a matter of correlating, seeing where all these data points might might line up, and then we could we could get you know a complete sort of uh, pick, be able to fuller picture of what's going on on the ground. But it, it is a matter of finding out where those dates are of the sampling and and um, and, and where the, the drone data um, was was captured, because obviously there's a lot of factors that affect that. Um, but certainly, I think now that we're, you know, I guess officially at the end, I'm still waiting for the last uh, batch of data to, to come in uh, from the last, uh, I guess, probably six months or so. Uh, then, then I'll have a good idea of what I've got, and we can start talking about you know, making those those connections. So, um, exciting times ahead. Yeah, it, it's also possible that Hilda and Sudova like noticed something and took some special observations. You know, like. Um, that would also be because citizen scientists are such great observers. So they might have, being in the environment, they might have actually picked up on something that wouldn't have otherwise been um, expected of this is the right time to collect the observations or something like that. Um, that would be interesting too. Uh, their mission is so organic that it's kind of like, um, you know, this, this kind of collaboration wasn't... Um, it wasn't planned in significantly in advance. It, it's different than our usual way of doing science, um, I guess. Uh, I, at least it is for me. I don't want to speak for anyone else, but um, there's something exciting about that as well. Um, the serendipitous nature and also just being flexible and uh, really um, there might be some big results that come out when you are even, I mean, possibly less tied than you are in kind of some traditional grants, um, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and, and don't disregard clouds, because yeah. uh, what we're trying to figure out, are there algae um, related to these layers that we're seeing, right? So when we were looking in Antarctica with the exp expedition boats and their observations, it seems like it's aerosols actually producing these cloud signatures on the ground, which would be extremely exciting. And so having all this knowledge and information about the phytoplankton and like Allison was saying of having a basically a time lapse of when these observations were taken and when things happened, we might be able to then overlay cloud or even weather, if you think of like meteorological conditions slash clouds, and we might have a good um, ecosystem, right? The, the systems approach that we might be able to see that going back to Liz is common. We did not plan on making it happen. So I think that's, I, oh, go ahead, please, Allison. I was just going to say, I think this is like a beautiful example of how even science is done is that you find people who have an idea, we learn about each other. So in this case, Hearts in the Ice and Sunny Von Hilda knew all of us individually, brought us together. Then we brainstormed some ideas of how to connect this. And then that is what's leading. I think Liz had mentioned this is that this is the seed of future funding potentials. This could go on. Like there's future potential even after 
the current winter sampling is over. So, you know, that's, that's how science is done. And this is the beauty of citizen science too. Wonderful. I know uh, Yana is uh, starting to have a little bit of a, a battery issue. Um, Yana, would you like to, to make any concluding statements before you head out? Well, I just want to repeat or uh, remind you that the seasonality is so extreme up here north. So this makes it very difficult to time your expeditions for what you would like to study, especially when it comes to phytoplankton bloom and when it's actually the spring starting. So that's the very, uh, what, what in a way made us very interested in the Bamsebu project since they are there all the time. So they are not limited to just those two weeks expedition, you know, and you never know if you actually are there uh, just before or if you hit it or you lost it totally, you know. So these continuous measurements are so important for uh, the Arctic and elsewhere too, that you have this uh, so you know uh, the story, you know, it's not just a little, uh, what to say, uh, snapshot, which often is the case for uh, scientists because it's so exp uh, expensive expeditions and so on. So to have these uh, yeah, regular data, baseline data is very important because even if you are coming the same time next year and you see totally different things, doesn't mean it's a big climate change, you know, it's just that you are in a different uh, biological season due to differences in uh, special cases in the environment that is not always related to climate. So it's very important with these um, many measurements. Thank you. Some of the things that I'm hearing people say from different perspectives are looking at um, science holistically from many different perspectives and looking at it relationally. Um, and I do not come from a science background, so I honestly don't know if this sort of level of collaboration between disciplines is normal or par for the course or if this is unique to this kind of project. Can you all speak a little bit to that? And, and also I'm interested, and I know Liz in the chat is interested to know if there are any um, big discoveries that you hope to find out more about um, from this level of collaboration with Arts in the Ice. I'll just say briefly that I think the interdisciplinary connections are extremely unusual in my um, in my case. Uh, so, you know, the fact that I've been able to talk with Allison about phytoplankton and even there's potential connection to uh, to space as well. Um, those aren't things that we could get funded, but they could be very important questions to research and just to get a start on. And also to help talking with um, Marile about the polar clouds. And even though we're both at NASA, um, we're in different divisions and some of those polar clouds are at really high altitude and, and you know, we definitely need to come together across those divisional boundaries. But citizen scientists don't see uh, these arbitrary kind of scientific silos. So that's one really wonderful um, aspect of collaborating with citizen scientists. Um, also really love what Jana just said about the long-term observations being particularly valuable and them being consistently there and consistently so excellent of what they are doing. That's, that's really where um, some of the, the impact is coming. Yeah, I do have to say that this um, systems approach has been starting when you go to the American Geophysical Union meetings and things like that, or AGU, um, but it's mostly modeling perspective is mostly what I've seen. This fact, this, that it's actual data samples, like in situ observations, I think is super unique um, in this aspect of systems approach. Really, really cool. Well, thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate everyone taking the time to be with us today as we look at this amazing new approach to looking at science through the extreme citizen science uh, work of Hearts in the Ice um, and the collaborators. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, 
And I just wanted to pass it quickly to Allison and Liz, if you have any final remarks. Uh, I, I wanted to say this has been great to talk as scientists kind of about the science. And then the next panel that we're going to have, we're going to be talking more about the impact to the different industries and the other aspects of citizen science projects, the methodology. And so I'm really excited about that um, part as well, since we've had such a cool discussion here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting. And I hope that we can keep going and and you know they've collected this valuable data um, and it's kind of now in our hands and uh, it's exciting, that's exciting also. Or will soon be in our hands. Yes, soon, second year. <laughs> yeah, it's been exciting to see everyone and, and of course also thank you to the live attendees. <laughs> thank you, I have put information about the um, SITSAI Connect workshop page, which has more details about everyone's projects and bios, a set of links, and some reflection questions to think about. Um, the second workshop is coming up a week from today, same time, same place. Um, and in the meantime, coming up um, the 21st, we have a plenary uh, featuring citizen scientists and including Hearts in the Ice themselves. So um, we definitely recommend that if you are able to attend on Friday, that you take a look at this because whenever I feel discouraged about the pandemic or about climate change, Hilda and Sinova always leave me feeling refreshed and energized and inspired and ready to make a difference. So I strongly recommend getting to see them speak. Um, and those links are in the chat. So thank you so much, everyone, once more for joining us today. And um, we all are very appreciative that you're here. Thank you so much for putting us together and great to see you guys, even, even though we still digital, but it's, it's better than nothing. So we'll have to have a big reunion with all of us. Can't wait. Can't wait. Can we go to Bobsabu? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. That was the plan. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Party at Bomb Spoo 2022. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Laura. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.